Welcome back to the Greenville Chamber's Growing a Greater Greenville podcast. I'm your host, Nelson Weston. Today's episode is the second of a five-part series on talent and workforce solutions. The series will equip employers with unique solutions and innovative approaches to solving their workforce challenges. Today, we are sitting down with Chris Richardson, General Counsel and Chief Operating Officer of BDV Solutions. We hope our listeners will leave with critical takeaways on how BDV Solutions is implementing innovative labor solutions for businesses. But before we begin, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank our presenting sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina. And with that, we'll get started. Chris, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you. So, Chris, for our listeners out there who may be unfamiliar with your organization and your work, can you tell us about BDV Solutions? What exactly do y'all do? Uh, First, thanks so much for having us. We're really excited to be here on the podcast. Um, So BDV Solutions is the largest uh, immigration agency in the world that focuses on what's called EB3 unskilled visas. Um, within the immigration world, um, there are two types of ways that an immigrant can move to the United States uh, to live in the United States. One is through family, like a spouse or um, your children or your parents. Uh, another is through employment. So an employer can sponsor you to live in the United States. Uh, within the employment realm, there are five different types of employment-based visas. And we focus on the third one, which is called EB3. And particularly, we focused on unskilled slash, you know, entry level jobs. And so that's what we focus on. And what we do as a company is we match foreign nationals, mostly who are already here in the country as students, with employers who are looking for workers. Uh, And so you have a lot of people who come to the U.S. on student visas or on H-1B And they say, hey, I would love to be able to stay in this country. And what we do is we say, okay, we'll match you with an employer. And that employer is going to help you uh, stay in the country via sponsorship. It's very fascinating and very insightful. Now, you mentioned that word employer just now. For the sake of clarity, do you primarily work with local employers or are your employers nationwide? You know, we started off uh, mostly here in Greenville and in South Carolina, but You know, as the labor shortage grew, um, we also grew as a team. And so we're now presently helping employers in uh, 38 states. And we have four nationals from 106 countries at this point. And we're looking at pushing that to 40 states and then maybe every state in the union. Because really, uh, the labor shortage really affects every employer um, across the country at this point. That's a very ambitious and industrious goal. Now, it does make me wonder, though, can we impact that a little bit more? What type of businesses make up your ideal employer partners? And furthermore, are there any certain industries that you typically work with? So for us, you know, we work with um, all sorts of industries. We work a lot with manufacturing companies. Uh, We work with franchises. Uh, We particularly have a strong presence among restaurants. That's a those are a lot of our clients are within restaurants. Um, Table 301 here in Greenville is an example of an employer that we work with. And so for us, um, there really is no one type of employer that we're looking for. We really like manufacturing companies. We really like helping those companies uh, because they're easier um, in terms of getting through through government regulations and questions. But uh, we work with all sorts of employers and helping them navigate the immigration process using EB3 Unskilled. So essentially both small business and big business. Is that what I'm hearing right now? Yes, that's right. We help both biz, big and small businesses really navigate this immigration process and we bring them those workers that they need. Um, and especially now with the labor shortages, there's a lot of companies that come to us and they say, look, if we don't get workers, we're not going to survive. Um, and so we really focus on finding and sourcing these foreign nationals who want to stay in the country who are hardworking and dedicated Uh, to work for businesses, large and small, uh, here in South Carolina and beyond. And speaking of the labor shortage, especially given the fact that we all just came out of a pandemic, what has that process been like? Can you share with us some insight over the last year or two in particular? You know, I think that what people have to understand about the labor shortage is that it's, it's not one 
person or mechanism's fault. It's just that it's a confluence of events that have really hurt us um, as a country. Um, you know, you have first baby boomers. Baby boomers are retiring at a huge rate. Um, there's going to be 65, 70, 80 million baby boomers in the next couple of years, and they're all going to be retiring. Uh, and we just, we need workers uh, in the country, but we we just don't have that those numbers that we did in terms of people. Um, and on top of that, we had uh, both COVID and um, the last couple of years a uh, really strict crackdown on immigration uh, that has also limited us in our ability to have uh, workers in the country. And so a confluence of both, you know, these three events really has changed the dynamic of employment these days. Uh, a lot of employers, they'll tell you that they are really struggling to find workers. And unfortunately, you know, that isn't something as, a, as easy as, oh, I don't have the worker, I can just cut off and do something else. Anyone who runs a business will tell you that if, you know, every worker is a profit center in and of themselves. And if you have five, 10 workers and you need those 10 workers, then guess what? You can build your business and go out and get 20 workers. Uh, you know, it really helps the economy as a whole. And so, you know, I think that that's the big, the, the sad part about this is that um, there are solutions out there, um, but I don't think that we're necessarily getting those solutions. You mentioned the economy just now. Let's focus on the Greenville economy and the job market here. From your experience, you know, just how big of a challenge is the labor shortage locally right here in our backyard? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. Um, you see help wanted signs all over Greenville. And the fact that Greenville is one of the fastest growing areas here in South Carolina and really throughout the country, um, you know, there are a lot of employers who are looking for labor, talented labor and hardworking labor. And so, you know, we work, like, like I said, across 38 states, but you know, we see it here in Greenville probably worse than other places that we really work with um, in terms of the labor shortage. Now, the roles that your organization is working to fill, are those which you would call primarily short-term, temporary, or full-time positions, or does it vary? No, we only do full-time, um, and that's because it's a requirement of the law that we only can uh, sponsor, we can only sponsor people who do full-time work. Uh, there are other types of visas, such as H-2B, that do temporary or seasonal work, but our workers are going to be full-time. Okay. Now, once they are employed, are the needs of this labor pool that you work with, are they unique from an employer perspective? No. Our employees, um, you know, they, what we always tell our employers is that you treat them the way you treat any other employee. And so, you know, there's nothing particularly special um, in terms of like uh, things that you have to, to, to do for them. Um, the most important thing is you treat them equally as you treat everybody else. But I will say, though, that the benefit to our employees is that these are mostly students. Um, they came to the United States to study. Uh, they speak strong English. Uh, they've already studied at American universities. And they have a strong desire to actually stay in the country. And so really, when they come work for you, they have skin in the game. They really want to show that they do a good job. They really want to get in. And from every employer that we've had who worked with these guys, uh, they've always told us how grateful they are to have these workers, how hardworking all of our workers are, and really how um, dedicated um, a lot of our workers are because they're really motivated. And these are the type of people that you want to be in your company because they want to stay here in this country. They know the value of a dollar and they work really, really hard. You mentioned students just now. What age group are we talking about here? Ballpark. Or 18 and up. So, um, you know, but 18 and up, like 18 all the way to, to 60 or 70, we have workers. Um, and, but really, you see a lot of foreign workers who really want to stay in our country. And this is something that's very separate than the situation at the border. Um, our people are already here in the country. Um, they've already established um, themselves through universities mostly or working for other companies. And so they've already have visa status. They've already gone through and regularized in that way. And so what we do is we say, hey, you know what? We know that you're here temporarily on a visa. Let's help you stay in the country permanently and go work for you know one of these companies that we um, source to come sponsor you. Now, Chris, I want to circle back to something that you mentioned a little while ago. We talked about how many baby boomers and uh, Generation X members are starting to retire at this point by the massive by massive numbers. What is the uh, change that you've noticed thus far when it comes to employers discussing the uh, the workforce and the uh, workplace 
when it comes to millennials and Generation Z, or these 18 year olds that you brought that you mentioned earlier, especially in stark contrast to the boomers and the Gen Xers that are retiring every single day? You know, our employers tell us that, um, you know, they just want hard workers. They just want people who are going to come to work and show up to work. Um, our workers are the people that, you know, we, we, we contract with or we work with rather, um, our clients are just really hard workers. And that's what we, we always hear, um, in terms of the generational divide, you know, I think that every generation thinks that their generation is the best generation. <laughs> you know, I think every generation thinks, oh, well, you know, my generation back in my day, we had to walk 20 miles across the snow and the field and the bush to get to school or get to work. And, and we walk barefoot, know, of course. Yeah. And we walk barefoot <laughs> uphill, downhill in the mud, in the pluff mud, as they say, down in Charleston. But I think, that, but I think though that, you know, um, every generation has its own challenges. Um, the older generations and, uh, and the newer generations. There are a lot of challenges that this generation has that my generation never had and the generation before me didn't have either. Uh, we didn't grow up with school shootings. We didn't grow up with uh, COVID-19. There was a lot of stuff that we didn't see growing up. And so I think that what's, what's needed in the country is grace on the side of all generations to understand and be compassionate about what every generation has to go through. Um, no generation has the market cornered on pain and suffering and um, no generation has the market cornered on hard work and the things that matter for our country. And so I think that one of the reasons why I've always loved working at BDV is that um, we really work with foreign nationals, people all over the world who have that um, understanding of the value of what our country um, can do for somebody in terms of turning their life around and helping them build um, build a life here. And I think that that's the positive of our country, irrespective of what generation um, we, we fall under. Okay, you mentioned uh, the topic of grace just now. Are there certain characteristics and personalities, if you will, that prospective employees are looking for out of the employer sponsors? What are you hearing? You know, absolutely. I think um, both for our clients and not just for our clients, but for any employee, I think that what you hear is that employees are really looking for employers that will see them not as a worker only, but as a future partner. I think that that's what we see with our four nationals. That's what we see when we hear from other employees is they really want employees, uh, employers rather, who will see them as you know, a future partner who really focus on both the positives and how do we make this person better and not just somebody who comes in and goes out. Um, so when we approach an employer, we want to know, hey, are you going to see this person as a partner who can really rise up in your industry? Um, and that's what we focus on. Okay. Now, uh, Chris, I want to change directions here. Let's talk about the advocacy work that you complete in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., what all does that entail? You know, I think that the thing about immigration is that so much of us just look at the border. We say, oh my God, the border, the border, the border. All these people are amassing at the border. It's always about the border. And unfortunately, our political leaders in Washington, that's the only thing they understand about immigration is the border. And so what I do and what our team does is we really try to educate our leaders, both here in South Carolina and nationally, that immigration is so much more than just the border. The border is actually very connected to the fact that our legal immigration system is broken. Um, we have a legal immigration system. We have these checks and balances. We have a process, but it's fundamentally broken. There are people who apply for visas and who go through this process and quote unquote wait in line. who are being asked to wait 120 years to get a green card, to live in this country. You're asking people to wait 120. They will die before they see this green card, right? And so you have this immigration system that was really built um, around 1990. Uh, we haven't had major immigration reform since 1990. So you're basically trying to shoehorn 1990 uh, America onto uh, policies onto 2023. We have an entirely different country than we did back then. And so, you know, if you are an immigrant or a foreign national and you're trying to apply to live in this country, it's an incredibly difficult process. Um, it's a lot of paperwork, paperwork even, right? Like everything else in the world is is technolo technologically based, but not this. This is the one area where you really see that we really are still living in 1990 in terms of paper requirements and in terms of 
our vetting and in terms of how long it takes. And also that the quotas that we have for the numbers of people who can live in the U.S. are incredibly small uh, compared to what we need. We have a 10 million uh, labor shortage or you know 10 million job openings or 9.6 million job openings now, but we only allow 10,000 per year immigrants to move to the country to actually work in this country at an entry-level jobs uh, and only 140,000 altogether. And so what we need in Washington is just one, our leaders need to understand this. But secondly, um, we need people just to explain to them what's going on. And so that's what we see ourselves doing at PDV is how do we explain to our congressional delegation and our leaders what's really going on on immigration so that they just don't get confused and think, oh, it's just the border. Now, do you feel like y'all are making any significant progress, not just up in the nation's capital, but also right down at the state house in Columbia with those leaders too? You know, I think with our leaders in Washington, D.C., we have made some headway in stopping bad bills. Um, we've made some headway in educating them on the need for reforming government agencies um, and pushing for reform of government agencies themselves. So in that way, it has been helpful. Um, and, you know, look, when we talk to leaders in Colombia or in Washington, I think everybody understands it. Once you explain it to them, they all get it. But it's just that everybody is just so um, encaptured or captured by their respective bases and their respective talking points that they never really want to publicly come out and say, this is what we need to do. Because ultimately, it's easier to shout and scream and get on TV and compete for TV eyeballs um, of a small subset of, of people rather than doing what's right for the country or doing what's good for the country. Um you know, William, uh, no, um, Henry Clay, who was a former Speaker of the House and ran for president four times, said, you know, I'd rather be right than be president. Um, he was right. He also was never president. And I think that that's the kind of leadership that we are sorely lacking as a country. And unfortunately, that's what I see on, on immigration far too much is that a lot of people who should know better choose not to know better uh, because it's politically expedient to not know better. So for all of our listeners out there, whether it be just the average uh, Joe Schmoes, whether it be small business, big business, or even uh, local and state leaders who may listen to this podcast, what is the key takeaway from today? What do you want them to know, both know and to carry with them going forward? That one, immigration is more than just a border and what they see on television. Um, that two, they should look outside their comfort zone and outside of whatever silo they've been assigned to to really try to understand these issues and understand that immigration is a large uh, and big situation. And three, that if you are an employer and you are struggling in this country, that there are companies such as such as our company, BDB Solutions out there, um, who can help you navigate the immigration process and system so that you can get a worker um, who is a foreign national who will help you hire more American workers, who will help you grow your business, who will help you expand your business. And that, you know, we're in the business of helping businesses and as an um, immigration agency, um, an employment immigration agency, we really want to help American workers and American business owners um, build their companies and thrive and strive. And best of all, add new Americans um, who have the same values and same love for this country as we do. So, Chris, how can businesses begin working with you and your organization today? Sure. They can go to www.bdvsolutions.com. That's Boy David Victor Solutions.com. Uh, we have a ton of information on our website that discusses our company and discusses how we can help you uh, solve your labor, labor shortages. Okay. Can we also find you on social media? Uh, well, everywhere on social media LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Friendster, MySpace. <laughs> wherever you can find me. <laughs> All right. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us here today and providing such remarkable insight on such a critical issue. Perfect. Thank you guys for having me. And to our listeners, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and supporting our podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, we encourage you to leave us a review, stay tuned for our next episode in the series, and of course, to follow us on each of our Greenville Chamber of Commerce social media pages and website. Once again, we'd also like to thank our presenting sponsor, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina.